Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our overview of process heating, compressed air, and building envelope measures. It's currently 2 p.m., so let's get started. My name is Portia Baldad, and I'm the marketing manager for the Inerva and Summerhill team. Inerva and Summerhill are supporting a mission reduction Alberta with the design and execution of the Energy Savings for Business program. Thanks for joining us. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. There are quite a few people attending today's webinar. As such, all microphones have been muted to avoid interruptions. Throughout the presentation, you can submit questions to our team through the control panel's questions feature. We'll answer those questions during our Q&A period at the end of today's webinar. If you cannot resolve your technical issues or need to leave early, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar on the ESB program website. It'll include both the presentation and the Q&A session. Today, we'll begin with a brief program overview, including eligible measures categories. We'll then review eligible process heating, compressed air, and building envelope measures technologies, program requirements, and the applications. Our team will also explain incentive measures calculations. We'll then end the presentation with a Q&A period. Today, Brittany Tran, Emission Reduction Alberta's Program Analyst, will provide a little background on ERA and the Energy Savings for Business program. Then my colleagues Patrick McMahon and Soria Narcia will jump in to guide us through eligible process heating, compressed air, and building envelope measures. Now let's get right into it. Here's Brittany to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Portia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions while supporting the economy benefits everyone. ERA's vision is anchored in the belief that our success is measured in both economic and environmental terms. Emissions Reduction Alberta has been investing in Alberta technologies and companies since 2009 to reduce emissions and grow Alberta's economy. Our investments help innovators develop and demonstrate GHG reducing technologies that lower costs, improve competitiveness, and accelerate Alberta's transformation towards decarbonization. We have worked across many sectors and have recently broadened our scope with the Energy Savings for Business program. This program will accelerate the adoption of commercially available technologies that will help businesses cut costs and reduce emissions. Learning from previous programs with similar scope, we have adapted the program to be more streamlined. We know time is money to Alberta businesses and we are committed to fast turnaround times. The program has been designed to reflect the realities of the pandemic. Incentive payments will be made electronically and all program materials are available in the digital downloadable format that can be easily printed by contractors or participants. We've also expanded the measures list to include categories that have not been offered previously, such as geothermal and compressed air. We've also made sure to include measures that are accessible to all businesses like ceiling and wall insulation, refrigerated case covers, efficient motors, lighting systems, and high efficiency windows. We will have over 300 measures to offer in this program. Energy savings can appear in several forms and range from building envelope, compressed air, and process heating in commercial and industrial spaces. We will continue to host more events like this one to help guide contractors and applicants through the program. If you missed any of the past webinars, we will post them to the website. To register for future webinars or view recordings, please visit eralberta.ca slash ESB. Before we get into the details of today's webinar, we wanted to share a quick note about the application process. We are seeing incomplete applications submitted in order to secure a funding reservation. Submitting an incomplete application does not secure funding. If a pre-project application is submitted but is not approved, it does not hold a place in line for the incentive reservation. The incentive is only reserved after the pre-project application is approved. It is important to submit good quality applications with complete documentation or the review cannot occur in a timely manner. If the application is incomplete or is missing information, it delays the review and the approval process and will be returned to you to require more information. With that said, we're glad you could join us today to review process heating, compressed air, and building envelope measures. I will now pass it off to Patrick and Surya to take you through how to apply for these categories of incentives. Thanks for that context, Brittany. I'm Patrick McMahon, the Contractor Experience Manager on the Inerva Summerhill team. We're proud to support Emissions Reduction Alberta through the delivery of the Energy Savings for Business program. To those on the line, thank you for calling into the webinar today and for your interest in the program. 
Today's webinar will cover measures identified under the process heating, compressed air, and building envelope measure categories. We'll provide some context on each of the measure category groups, including a review of indicative components of the application process. Then, as Portia mentioned, we'll address some of the program calculations as they relate to incentive definition. Let's get started with process heating. I'm once again joined by my colleague, Surya Narcia, who helped me understand these products and their fit within the Energy Savings for Business program. Surya, can you help me better understand what we mean by process heating? Sure. Hi, everyone. Here we are referring to the usage of steam or hot water to provide heating in industrial and commercial process heating. So one example could be where steam is used to heat water in a heat exchanger, which is then used for other processes. This is a, an example of an indirect heating process where you can recover and reuse the condensate. Another example is a meat processing facility where this, they use steam to sterilize and partially cook the product. This is a case of a direct heating process where the steam is fully consumed and there is no condensate return. And part of this program is also space heating is also included. What categories of equipment are included in the energy savings for business and uh, how do they save energy? So process heating includes incentive for steam traps replacement. If you have a failed or a leaky trap, here is a good opportunity to, to get them replaced. Leaky traps can waste a significant amount of uh, energy. Economizers are also included. These are heat exchangers that would use the energy from the hot flue gas to preheat feed water. The program is incentivizing both conventional, that is non-condensing, and as well as condensing economizers. And finally, in this group, we also have insulation for pipes and fittings. We realize that very often insulation breaks or sometimes are insufficient. So this program is encouraging businesses to audit their existing insulation and consider either increasing the layers or replace with new insulation of a higher R value of at least four. The available incentives are offered either based on a per unit or capacity, such as MBH. And uh, I would refer you to, I would refer everyone to review the eligible measures list for more details on that. Thanks for that, Saria. Could you tell us more about the eligibility requirements? Absolutely. So to be eligible, steam traps must be in service and have failed either mechanically jammed or they're plugged or even leaking through. And to note that <clears throat> new projects are not included in this uh, program. For economizers, they are to be used for boiler feed water preheating from the flue gas. Both process and space heating boilers are included. The incentives would cap at $20,000 for conventional or non-condensing economizers while for condensing economizers, the maximum amount is $30,000. And once again, note that replacing an existing economizer is not eligible. <clears throat> for insulation, the incentive is available for both pipes and fittings. For fittings, what you can do is you can provide the equivalent length of straight pipe for the rebates calculations. The material has to be high density fiberglass or closed cell elastomeric flow foam insulation. If you're insulating a new pipe, bare pipe, the minimum R value must be four. And in the case where you're adding layers on existing insulation, then the final R value must also be at least four. To continue here, um, if you are, when you're submitting an application, you will have to provide the specification sheets for all of the new equipment. And for the all the three measures that I've mentioned, you must provide the boiler system annual operating hours, the boiler capacity, and the nameplate rated thermal efficiency. Additionally, for steam traps, you will need to specify if the steam is superheated or saturated, and obviously the diameter and the type of trap that is being replaced. We'll take that opportunity here to introduce the application flow. With these measure categories, there are a variety of measure types, creating a number of options. We'll walk through some indicative application flows, and for the first, under process heating measure type, will be the steam traps. 
Adding a measure can be completed by the participant or at the participant's discretion, they can enable their eligible contractor to complete this component of the application process. The addition of a measure starts on step four of the pre-application process by clicking on the add measure button at the top of the web page. In this example for process heating, the measure category is selected from the appropriate dropdown, then the measure type. Again, in this case, we'll walk through a steam trap example. The dropdown under the measure reflects the description of the various measures as defined in the measures list and can be matched to the description found in the measure and minimum eligibility column from within the measures list. The steam trap example and many of the measures we'll review today have especially straightforward application forms as it relates to the measure specific detail that will need to be provided. In this example, the quantity of the specific measure will need to be inputted. Please note, if a number of measures of different characteristics are being added, they, may, they will need to be added separately. In the case of steam traps, that's for traps featuring different diameters. The addition of a measure must only reflect common products and different products installed at the same facility will need to be added separately. Once the quantity of the specific steam trap has been added, the user will need to upload the spec sheet for the product expected to be installed. In the case of steam traps, the application requires the identification if the steam trap steam in the process is saturated or superheated, and the type of steam trap being one of thermostatic, mechanical float, mechanical inverted bucket, or thermodynamic. The diameter in inches of the steam trap is required, as is an estimate of the annual operating hours of the boiler system, the boiler input capacity to MBH, and the boiler thermal efficiency. You'll see the assumed per measure emission reduction is populated. We'll cover other emissions calculations and cost allocation at the end, as the implication is common to all measures and their inclusion. Surya, I have some questions to help me understand the opportunity for emissions reduction through the reducing uh, through reducing waste with compressed air systems. How significant is compressed air as an energy use and energy cost consideration for businesses? Yes, so compressed air production is indeed very costly <clears throat> and is also an essential element in many facilities, so much so that the industry professionals sometimes even call it the fourth utility in addition to electricity, gas, and water. So for this reason, the ESB program has included this measure and is encouraging businesses to look into their systems and see how they can be upgraded and implement best practices to make them more efficient. That's great. How can the energy savings for business program help businesses reduce energy consumption by investing in compressed air systems? So this program is incentivizing a good set of measures to encourage businesses go the extra mile. Here you can take the opportunity to upgrade your fixed speed compressors to VFD integrated units. In this case, we have incentives available up to $30,000. If a potential participant has condensate drains that are either manual or work on timers, these are very uh, inefficient. They can be easily replaced by automatic zero loss drains. These drains will only work when liquid is present and in that situation will not allow compressed air to escape. Another incentive is for engineered nozzles. These are more efficient than standard nozzles and obviously much more efficient than open pipes, which we can still see uh, operating in certain uh, types of facilities. Then we have storage tanks or air receivers. This incentive provides an opportunity for businesses to upgrade their primary storage capacity. Storage tanks always help during surge demands and also avoid the compressors from short cycling. Incentives vary with sizes of tanks and the measures list will provide the different incentives for the different ranges of uh, tank capacity in US gallons. Air dryers are also part of the program. Incentives are available for upgrades to high efficiency refrigerated dryer, or if you're considering desiccant dryers, uh, you can upgrade to the new ones with, which have dew point controls to optimize regeneration cycles. And finally, low pressure drop filters are also offered to replace old filters which are having uh, higher pressure drops. 
It sounds like there's a lot of options. Could you share some of the eligibility considerations that participants and contractors would be good to understand proactively? Yes, uh, indeed, uh, there's a lot of measures that are being offered in this category. So for the new VFD compressor, it must be replacing a fixed speed compressor. And very important, it should not be a backup unit. For zero loss drains, they are incentivized in the case when they're replacing other drain types, such as manual drains or timer controlled. They are not eligible if you are replacing an existing zero loss drain. Compressed air storage tanks are eligible when you're increasing the primary storage capacity. Engineered nozzles are to be installed on open pipes or either replacing non-efficient types of nozzles. With regards to air dryers, the refrigerated types must be replacing a non-cycling dryer. And for the case of desiccant dryers, they must be equipped with dew point controls to optimize the re regeneration cycle. And finally, the eligibility for low pressure drop filters is that they need to be designed to have a pressure drop not exceeding one PSIG, and they must be replacing an old, like uh, a coalescing filter. When you are submitting an application, it's important for us to have a <clears throat> copy of all the spec all the spec sheets for all the new equipment. Additionally, you will need to provide us for some details on the existing compressed air system. And this includes the operating pressure, the number of compressors in operation, the types and their related horsepower and CFM. And what you can also do is upload a picture of the nameplates. Also, we need to know if there are any compressors on standby and maybe from your list, you can indicate which of those compressors are on standby. You need to also provide us with an, ex, uh, with an estimate or an approximate loading percentage of the working units. And finally, for all the equipment that are being replaced, you'll need to specify the types of these units. For example, if you're replacing a dryer, you need to specify what is the type of the existing dryer. Thanks, Ria. Lots of criteria to consider, and important that contractors and participants review the measures list for eligibility criteria early in the planning phases of projects that may be eligible for the Energy Savings for Business program. To showcase what this means with an indicative measure application, we'll work through a compressed air storage measure addition, the compressed air category by selecting the specific power of the compressed air storage product. Measures can be added by participants or eligible contractors the participant has selected earlier in the application process and have been invited to support the application. Adding this measure starts by defining the quantity of the compressed air storage assets being installed. If products have different capacity that are outside of the threshold for a given incentive, they will need to be added separately. The compressed air in pounds per square inch is the operating pressure maintained by the system is required. The user will select the type of air compressor used in the system from a dropdown, including rotary screw, reciprocating, or other, and will need to know if the tank being replaced is the primary tank in the compressed air storage system. The horsepower of the compressor associated with the storage tank is required, and the specific volume of the tank being installed within the measure range uh, it needs to be recorded in US gallons. The age of the compressor and the approximate average loading is required before uploading the spec sheet of the new storage tank by dragging the document into the gray area or clicking to explore and find the right document. The fields below relate to emissions reduction estimates and costs, which we'll cover after a look at the building envelope measures. Surya, I understand that building envelopes can present real energy opportunities for many buildings, especially older buildings. Can you let me know what types of measures are included in this category? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's quite a good set of measures here as well. The first one is air curtains for shipping or receiving areas, as well as pedestrian access. These are all eligible for incentives. This group also cover loading dock, loading dock door seals. And in incentives are available here for both the compression and shelter types. And insulation rates are, for these, they are based on the size of the openings. The program also covers wall and ceiling insulation, as well as high efficiency windows. 
and incentives are offered based on the surface area to be covered. The eligible measures list provides a lot of details on the amount of rebate for each category. So we would encourage you, everyone, to take a look at that. Thanks, Ria. Can you summarize some of those criteria for this measure category? Yes, absolutely. To be eligible, the air credits must be tested by a third party performance standard, such as ANSI, ANSI or AMCA, or other similar bodies. And uh, <clears throat> air credits would not be eligible if you already have other mechanisms that combat infiltration at the shipping or receiving doors, such as if you already have dock door seals, you cannot apply for air curtains. Similarly, for dock door seals, both replacement of damaged seals or the addition of new seals are eligible, but you cannot, uh, if you have dock door seals, sorry, if you have air curtains, you cannot apply for dock door seals. For ceiling and wall insulation, it is required that the combined insulation meet or exceed even the minimum R value as uh, it is stated in the measures list. And finally, for high efficiency windows, it is required that they have a U value of thermal resistance no more than 0 0.3. When you're submitting an application, it's very important again to submit all the spec sheets for all the new equipment. You need to provide us with the opening dimensions, the length and the width for the air curtains, as well as for the dock door applications. And similarly for the high efficiency windows or the wall or even ceiling insulation, you need to provide us with the surface area to be covered and the relevant R values or U values as, uh, as applicable. Let's have a look at the measure addition of an indicative building envelope measure. And in this case, we'll be working through an air curtain. This application review and the others in the webinar starts after the add measure button has been clicked through the measure and project summary stage of an application. This is again available to the participant or their contractor if they've been granted access by the participant earlier in the application process. The user adding the measure will select the building envelope and windows as the measure category. The measure type will be the type of equipment being installed, in this case, air curtains. Then the user will choose from a list based on the specific measures planned for installation from the eligible measures list. You'll find that the description in the dropdown matches what's provided within the measure and minimum eligibility column from within the measures list. The quantity of this measure, uh, the quantity of the same measure will need to be inputted and then they'll need to upload a spec sheet for the product. The balance of the questions are pretty easy, including the height covered by the air curtain and the width covered by the air curtain, both in feet. You'll see the per unit emissions reductions automatically populates. This conveniently brings us to the common emissions and cost section of the measure addition module. This is true for adding any and all measures to an application. As was mentioned in other application walkthroughs, the per unit emissions reduction reflects the assumed per measure emissions reduction. The total emissions reduction reflects an estimate based on some of the measure specific variables entered through the measure addition module that were covered for each measure addition showcased earlier in the webinar. It will be calculated when the user ultimately clicks on the get calculated values button. Inputs required to complete the measure addition include costs separated between equipment and material costs, labor and design costs. When multiple measures will be included on a single application, Costs such as labor for installation or eligible design or audit costs should be allocated across the various measures on the application. When this is necessary, it will be helpful as a tip to share how costs were allocated in a simple summary document added at step five in the application process. That's the step where documents about the whole project are added. Please note that labor costs should only reflect costs associated with installation, while other costs, excluding equipment and material costs, should be allocated to the design cost field. In addition to this, where measures are being installed by staff of the participant, labor costs are not considered an eligible cost. The rebate application will calculate three values relating to the incentive that will be calculated when the Get Calculated Values button is ultimately clicked. Understanding these values in the context of the program may be helpful. 
The first is the measure incentive, which is the per unit incentive multiplied by the eligible quantity of measures being added through this specific measure addition. The maximum eligible measure incentive reflects the incentive cap applied to the sum of all eligible costs. For example, if the sum of costs was $100,000 and the incentive cap was defined as 50%, the maximum eligible measure incentive would calculate to $50,000. The total eligible measure incentive is the lower of either the maximum eligible measure incentive or the measure incentive. The values will calculate after the Get Calculated Values button is clicked, and the application will identify any missing fields. Take this opportunity to review the measure uh, set to be added for accuracy before clicking to add the measure to the application. This process from adding measures, defining costs, and review is repeated for other measures to be included as a part of the project at the facility included in a single application for incentive approval. I appreciate that these terms could be a bit confusing, so let's look at uh, the incentive calculations in the context of, context of two hypothetical projects. The first, that facility A is an economizer installation, and that facility B is the installation of a VFD integrated compressor. At facility A, the economizer project has a cost of $21,500 for an economizer with a capacity of 4,000 MBH. In this example, the potential measure incentive is $12,000 based on the 4,000 MBH capacity of the economizer times the incentive rate of $3 per MBH. The maximum eligible measure incentive will be based on the 50% incentive cap, considering the $21,500 of defined cost. This calculates to $10,750. For this example, since the maximum eligible measure incentive is lower than the potential measure incentive, the total eligible measure incentive is the value associated with the incentive cap. The maximum eligible measure incentive, $10,750. Moving over to facility B, the VFD integrated compressor measure has a cost of $61,200 with a compressor for, with, that uh, has a 50 horsepower rating. In this example, the potential measure incentive is $7,500 for the VFD integrated compressor of 50 horsepower as defined in the measures list. The maximum eligible measure incentive will be based on the 50% incentive cap, considering the $61,200 in eligible cost, which calculates to $30,600. In this example, the potential measure incentive is the lower of the maximum eligible measure incentive, so the total eligible measure incentive is the potential measure incentive and not impacted by the incentive cap. Here's a summary of the projects and the application of the incentive values. We see the cost for the projects, then the incentive levels based on the measures list. In both cases, the maximum eligible measure value is based on a 50% of total costs, and the eligible measure incentive is the lower of the calculated incentive values.